and we are live! Greetings and salutations, my beautiful beans, and welcome to a very special interview because today we have yes. Duke Davis. Duke, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm so hyped because today Good. we are talking one shots. Woo! Freaking love one shots. It is, of course, a adventure April over on World Anvil. So we are challenging all of you to write one shots. And today we are specializing because we had Duke here last last month, last year. Yes, it, last yeah, unit last of year. time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We had Duke uh, last year to talk about one shots because one shots kind of a kind of a specialty of Duke over there, a um, bit. and so we thought we'd refine it a bit more. This year we're talking about one shots in dungeons, how to do them, how not to do them, what to watch out for, what cunning tricks you can use. We will be revealing all, and of course, if you have questions, get those into the chat. Click the flaming anvil underneath the chat window, and uh, yeah. One anvil point will get you a question. Keep them coming. We'll be doing them all at the end of the stream. Woo. And, and, if that wasn't all, we got a raffle. Demetrius go. will be, will be uh, deploying the raffle, but we are raffling off a $50 gift card today from giftcard.com from the amazing ML Hammond, one of our spectacular deities. So thank you so much, ML Hammond, for that incredible incredible prize uh which somebody will win again we will be announcing that at the end of the stream and you've got to go stick around to claim your prize just 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 putting it out there now you've got to stick <laughs> around to claim your prize or it will go to somebody else and that will be sad so i've just talked talked a lot let me introduce duke so he can do the talking duke <laughs> started playing D D in early 2019 and was instantly hooked and then a month later became a dm and then like a month after that became a twitch dm where he really specialized on short campaigns and ex even more on one shots um mm -hmm. and uh yeah those uh those episodes are they still available those one shots can we find them somewhere uh they are currently hidden because <gasps> secret. <laughs> they're secret <laughs> Because I, I rewatched a couple of them and I went, ah, that's that's cringy. And I hit them because I was oh. getting a bigger audience. <laughs> oh, the pain of looking back at early content. I know. <laughs> oh, it hurts. It happens to us it all. It does. But folks, you can find Duke over on YouTube creating hilarious and entertaining D&D &D content. You have a new channel up, don't you? What is that? I do. So we got One Shot Quips, which is the comedy channel. Yeah. And we got One Shot Questers, mm -hmm. which is still focusing around D&D &D and tabletop RPG. But we're we're trying to do it in a different way. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to explain. We're just trying to bring fantasy into real life. Like, We've been playing D and D. We've been trying to do. Uh, we've been playing tabletop games for so long. Let's now bring it into real life, and that's our goal. Um, kind of going forward, and so it, it's just going to be a bit easier when we get videos out to, to kind of more describe what we're trying to do. But they're coming. I promise. They're coming. I cannot yeah. wait. Honestly, I cannot mm -hmm. wait to see these. I'm so excited. Some of the stuff that you told me behind the scenes, it just sounds freaking hilarious so i'm really this looking forward great. to that but let's get on to our one shot topic why are dungeons great for one shots dungeons are fantastic for one shots because i for one if you are in a one shot usually it's like most of the time it's either you are missing quite a few people in your session or it's people just want to have a kind of a break from your current session and a dungeon is pretty good for one shot because in my opinion it one shots are very much you need to get from point a to point b dungeons are very good with that because you got to create like a little maze where you have to get from point a to point b yes you could put areas where people can go and explore and like check out different rooms and everything but it's not going to be like oh here's here's a town here's a world that you're surrounded by a forest and the like what the DM's trying to do is be like, OK, you guys got to stay in the town. But then the players are like, we want to go adventure in the forest and then things get rude for a dungeon. It's perfect <laughs> because they're 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 focused in the dungeon mainly and they got to get from point A to point B. And so I, I feel like that's where things can really go uh, well with dungeons. And plus, if you're limited on time as well, that also helps as well, just like kind of limiting some things but in a good way in a good way 
Yeah, absolutely. I think one shots, there's a, there's a buy-in with one shots for yes. players. And I think that buy-in is okay. We're going to, we're going to follow the plot. We're not yeah. sandboxing it. We yeah. will follow the plot that you set out GM. We promise. We promise not to lick things. We're just going to do what we're told ish probably ish. we'll have fun doing it yes um, and that's sort of the social construct of one shots as opposed to a bigger campaign where there is time to go off and lick trees and investigate that forest <laughs> yes. over there that you totally didn't world build yet but that's fine mm -hmm. it takes them a session to get there so hey it's fine. right right like that is that is campaign these are campaign problems these are uh -huh. you know first world campaign problems but these are not one shot problems in one shots there is that buy-in yeah. right yeah. and that's why a, a dungeon can be great the other thing I like about dungeons is uh, in writing, we call it media res. So pushing people straight into the action, yes. not loads of setup. Dungeons are great for that. They're already at the action. They arrive at the action. That's where you can start. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's, I don't know what to add off of that. That's like perfect. You kind of sum things up pretty well there. <laughs> yeah, totally. So um, that's that's all very well and good. Dungeons, great for yes. one shots. Our beans in yes. the audience who are building one shots right now, consider a dungeon. They can be awesome. Where do you start when you're concepting a dungeon? I like to think of a theme for the dungeon. That's my very first thought. Like, all right, what is this dungeon going to be around? Because the one thing that I have learned when creating dungeons is... I'll give you a good example and a bad example. Uh, the good example is when I create a theme around it, I know what to put in my dungeon. I know what's going to make sense in the dungeon. I know what's going to work and not what not going to work. Uh, a bad dungeon idea is when you kind of just create a maze and then you're like, okay, I need to like, uh, uh, all right, I, I made all these rooms, but now what do I throw in them? Because um, I don't want my players to enter an empty room. And so people will just start throwing in random things in the rooms that don't really make sense. Yeah. And so to start off, definitely start off with a theme. I'll give you a couple ideas that I've done in the past that have worked very well. I did an illusion dungeon where everything was an illusion. Yeah. And also there were some things that weren't illusions, kind of throw people off a bit like, here's a big hole in the ground that has a bunch of teeth in there. And you hear this rustling, like almost like breathing happening from it, but it's not really, it's just a throw you off thing and that like, it's actually real. But when you get down to the bottom, you find that there's another opening where wind is coming through. And yeah. so that's just fun to put in. Um, we also did one where like for an illusion where you saw a fountain and you saw gold pieces at the bottom of a fountain. People were like, oh, I try to go grab it. And so when people try to go grab it, there'd be these tentacles that come up and grab the arms of those people and drag them down. And when people would get in, they would find that the fountain is just this massive pool of water. And um, the gold coins are actually like tentacles and kind of like lining up with their eyesight. So it looks like it's they're closer. Um, so that's another thing I did. One of the most creative ones I did and was one of my favorite ones ever dungeon that I made. It wasn't really a dungeon, but I made it in a dungeon was my players got eaten by this giant worm. And I looked at the anatomy of a worm and I like researched it. Yeah. And I built a dungeon from the, uh, from the anatomy of it. So it'd be like, okay, you start in the esophagus. Now you go down. Okay. Now you're in the stomach. Oh, there's some passageways over to your right and to your left. Those are the kidneys. You find a lot of stones in there. They're worth a lot of money. And, and, and then we move our way down. Just so much fun. That was like the most fun I think I've ever had at a dungeon, but yes, start off with themes. <laughs> so I have, I actually did exactly that. When I wrote the dark crystal, there is a dungeon oh, yeah? in there that is the belly of a giant sea creature yeah so you you get swallowed by the sea creature um this is one of the hazards that you can encounter when you go to sea and then mm -hmm. you're basically in a giant dungeon and you have to figure your way <laughs> out but it's the sea yeah. creature and there's people in there and it's it's a right. whole ecosystem um i'd like to take credit for for like the people in the ecosystems that actually already existed in the in the world i was like we're gonna turn this into a dungeon this is yeah happening. yeah that's awesome <laughs> But um, one of the things that I really like to do, and this is because I am a world builder and a giant freaking nerd, <laughs> is I like to figure out why the dungeon is there in the first place. That's yes. where I like to start. And I know that not all GMs need to do that step. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, so one example, I created a dungeon that was an abandoned monastery. 
Um, okay. And that already gave me so many ideas for, okay, how am I going to start? What are the, what are people going to meet? You know, like, okay, it's an abandoned monastery. What happened next? Or, yeah. and, and these kinds of things. And that for me was such a good start off point, or it used to be a zoo. I've done one that was a museum of magical, magical curiosities, which meant that, you know, all the curiosities had been left for ages and they, they'd gone feral. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, and this is again very personal and very world buildery, starting yeah. with what it used to be gives you so many ideas for yes. like what can I do and what will they meet. But also it gives you a structure because you're not making a dungeon, which is like an amorphous thing. You're making a museum. Yeah. There's a place to hang your coats, there's an entry hall, there there are display rooms. That's easy. I can mm -hmm. do that. Um so it gives you like a, a really good thing to jump off. So that's where I like to start. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic thing to do as well. Like, I feel like dungeons do need to make sense because if it's just like you, your players are thrown into like a killer dungeon, they just just like who who in the right mind would make something like that? Like, like really, who would? Um, and so like one of the things I did that was like kind of a dungeon, but there were more ruins was when we tried to do our second campaign. Uh, my players went into this abandoned. Uh, this these abandoned ruins. I can't remember the purpose of said room. There was there was some. Oh, it was like a, it was like a some type of teleportation. I can't remember. I honestly cannot remember. But uh, what they did there was it was a big scientist room, mm. and so you had this big large open room with like this big contraption in the middle, and then around it you saw a bunch of doors, and each door held a different piece of a lab so there'd be like the actual lab there would be like the armory um in one room there was like a like a, a discard like a garbage room in a way and so when my players went in they found like all these gold pieces and it was super cool but they were thrown in there for a reason because all these gold pieces were mini mimics and they would eat your gold and so like my players were like oh this is really cool and they gathered all the gold pieces and then when they reached in for, to their pocket, they either got bit or found that all of their gold pieces were gone and they had a big old hole in it. And so it was really cool. It was it was very interesting. And when you get the idea of why it was there first and what people did in there, you, your brain just goes so many different directions of what you could do with it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say that um, wait, I completely lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry about that. You're good. Um, I was going to say that um, I read this amazing article recently that was super interesting um, that was talking about the evolution of the dungeon yes. in the way that we play Dungeons and Dragons. So originally, the kinds of dungeons that you were talking about where it's like, there's some rooms, there's like a zombie in one, yeah. and a fey, fey having a bad hair day in another one, and then some mm -hmm. other thing in room number three. And it's all a bit random, but it's like an Basically, it's like a fantasy obstacle course, almost. Yes. Like, here's some random stuff. Fight it. The end. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's been such a progression of uh, of the way we approach Dungeons & Dragons in general, and Dungeons in particular, to be so much more story-related. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't want to ask that question yet. I have a question that I really want to ask, but I'm going to ask it okay. later. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, how do you like to structure your dungeons? Are there any particular ingredients that you always use or regularly use that's a very very good question i i guess it depends on what my party is feeling at that time so yeah. i definitely like ask them be like hey when we're we're, we're going to be going into a dungeon and what would you guys like to do? Would you guys want to do a dungeon that's filled with like riddles or would you guys want something that's more death defying or more battles or one of those where you got to figure out a lot of puzzles? Um, so that is what I would ask my players first. And then a lot of them would be like, well, we haven't really fought anything for a while when we want to do some combat or oh, we've been doing a lot of combat lately. I would like to do some a uh, dungeon that has a lot of role playing involved with it. And so that's where I will start off. And once I figure that out for my players, that's when I will start building the, nice. the dungeon because it's always good to get feedback from the players to ask what they want. Because if you build what they want, they're going to be way more engaged with it and have a lot more fun exploring and 
them being happy and as well, like make it in a way that you're happy as well as a DM. That's that's very important. You need to please the players and you also need to please yourself with your creations. So, yeah, that's how, that's how I really start off. I don't have I just ask what my players want and then I I go from there. I love that. That makes me so happy. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's about having fun. Start uh-huh. by saying what kind of fun do you want to have? Yeah, exactly. I think that's so cool. What do you think people get wrong with dungeons? Like if you could pick a couple of like, ooh, faux pas or ooh, that didn't work for me even. Right. I, th- oh man, there's a lot of things I can go wrong with a dungeon. So I'll, I'll, I'll restate what I said last. Um, people will create the actual dungeon first and then they'll just try to fill the rooms and a lot of the rooms just don't make sense. And so that's where it's like, um, that's where you could run into issues with your dungeons is where they just don't make sense because it's just kind of chaotic and people like it gives your players a very false sense of like what to expect because they can open a door full of kittens in one room and then open a door full of beholders in the other room type of a thing and so the L, that's like you, there needs to be some type of story there needs to be some type of theme revolved around that dungeon where it makes sense like if your dungeon is something where it's like it, it it's kind of like an underground ecosystem and you enter like in a grassy land first and then you open another door and it's um it's like volcanic rock and then the other door is like all ice to like an ice age type of thing that makes sense because there's a theme and your players are like okay what's going to be behind it like what do we expect through this door with like nature in a way um i also think a lot of people think when you go into a dungeon and this could be just like cinema or how we have viewed uh things growing up is a lot of people think dungeons need to be like death traps Mm. And so that's where, like, again, there could be some where if you like Tomb of Annihilation, those dungeons were built by gods and they didn't want people going through or they would want people to make sure that they were worthy enough to get what was in there. Um, And so they created these death defying traps for people to go through. And that that to me, that makes sense. But because we knew what we were getting ourselves into and that wouldn't just that was the first campaign I ever played. That was stressful. Um, but, um, not, they, they always don't need to be death defying. They, they really don't do. You don't have to put like a sudden death spike trap in the middle of nowhere. And then someone's character is gone. Cause again, these players have took a lot of time and has gotten emotionally invested into their, um, their characters and have them just like killed off by one check is kind of a little bit brutal. So that's what I would say. Like people would go wrong with making it the average dungeon where everything has to be death defying or they, they kind of just throw it all together without really a theme. That's where I feel like a lot of people will go wrong with it. Nice. I like that. I think a mm-hmm. lot of GMs, particularly GMs starting out, they, yeah. they feel like they want to do everything in the kitchen sink, both for both yep. of those things. They want yep. to, make every cool thing all in this one dungeon because it's the first one they've made so they, yes. they bring in too many different elements so you get that like what's behind door number three feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but the other thing is that they feel like oh i'm making a dungeon my players they're gonna get really excited about it if i make it really dangerous and then they make it really yeah. dangerous and their players die and they hate it yep it's not fun yeah um, exactly like make it fun <laughs> yeah and i think that's that really unifies both of the things that you said essentially the biggest issue with where what people get wrong with dungeons is they forget to make it fun yeah so you know when you build up player expectations that's when you can either confirm or subvert them that's fun Mm -hmm. that's exciting when it's like a random roll table what the hell is it going to be next Uh uh-huh it's not really fun because you're basically you're just playing numbers at that point yeah no for sure yeah so um how important for you is the history and or the ecosystem of a dungeon in your opinion this is a real opinion question my own opinion yeah i on a scale of one to ten if i'm being honest it's like a seven yeah fair enough because sometimes i'll just want to make a dungeon with a theme where people can just go through and there's nothing really a whole lot but it is important to have a little bit of history behind it 
That way you kind of keep the magic alive in the tabletop in, in your game. Yeah. And uh, so, and also it's to help with your players feel like there was, there was an actual story behind this. And so they yeah. can get excited because everyone has at least one or two players in their campaign where it's like, there's nothing here. Like you can tell them straight up. There's nothing here. Do not even look. There's absolutely, you are in a bare, bare room. Like there is nothing in this room. They will still go. Well, I want to search for what's in this room. Do I find anything in this room? And so it's like, yes, you do need to put some elements of history or story in the dungeon. So like you satisfy their needs and also it, it could either like as well with the dungeon and making just like a little story or history, you, you can very fully flesh out that dungeon just a little bit more. Like you missing that one element. Okay. Make a little story behind it. Okay. Now you figured it out. Um, you realize that what was missing. So like, again, it's like seven out of 10. Like I, it's important to have, but if I can, not put a story in it and just make a fun dungeon. I'm happy to do that as well. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And I think it depends, you know, dungeon to dungeon. Like if yeah, if some dungeons you've got you've got other things that you're busy with. You know, mm -hmm. like there are other things that you've decided to do. Um, yes. For me, I love it because uh, that's how I bring. So there's four kinds of encounters, obviously. Yeah. Combat encounters, puzzle encounters, social encounters, and exploration encounters. Yes. For me. That is the exploration bit of a dungeon. Is what the hell was this? Mm -hmm. That's it's not just like kicking open doors and finding rooms because a lot of rooms in a dungeon will probably not look that different from one another. Right. So for me, part of that exploration is piecing that together. Like in this room, you find this, that, and the other, and either they'll put it together themselves, or you'd be like, "Yes, this was a dormitory." And then yeah. when they're like, oh, it's a dormitory. Oh, are there any boxes? Oh, can I search under the pillows? Yes, yep. you find some personal items. You find a letter. And you can, this is stuff you can riff. This isn't stuff yeah. you need to prepare. Yeah. Um, but you can, you can add, like, for me, that's exploration. That's how you yeah. bring the exploration component to a dungeon, in my opinion. Yes, I like that. I like that a lot. Do you have other tips for that? Obviously, like my next questions will all be about encounters, how to bring encounters. And I think yeah. for dungeons, that exploration question is always a tricky one because it's not, you're not roving through scenery, right? Yeah, you're you're yeah. in a space. It's enclosed. Yeah. There's limits. Uh, like I, I will place things here and then like pre place things that will help me when yeah. my players are going through that way like you know i'm not just riffing everything or just having to improv everything there's like some structure within this dungeon um but i think i also think it's important to read what your players are doing and saying what they're trying to find because like let's say one guy is constantly like trying to find weapons in here like was oh, there any like magic weapons or things like that or uh, someone's trying to find a certain book that could probably help them. Um, you may not think about that when you're building the dungeon. And so you always have to listen to what your players are trying to do. Listen to uh, try to see what they are trying to accomplish with their characters. And then just be like, oh, and like what you said, you find a bed and under the bed, you find a magical sword. It grants you plus one. Uh, like it's a plus one short sword. Or like you find some books that state this area of what you're trying to find. Like you could easily throw it in. Again, it's a one shot. It's not that big. But to your players, it would mean just everything because it's like, ooh, this is exactly what I was trying to look for. I am very satisfied and we can continue on with the, the dungeon. So, yeah, just like have, have a, some structures, but also listen to your players and throw some things in. I think every time a player asks a question, um, they are telling you what they want and what yeah. their expectations of the game are. Yes. So I think you're absolutely right. Listen to those questions. If nobody's asking about the question, their history, they, they're not interested in that. They yeah. don't want exploration. Right. They want to go hit something. Give them something uh -huh. to hit. That's fine. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, no, I, I really like that. And I think that that is, that is absolutely key. And I think that when you're writing one shots for others, that's one of the reasons why it's so important to include different kinds of encounters. Because mm -hmm. you will have different kinds of players in the same party. And if you only include combat count encounters, there'll be yeah. some rogue archaeologist trailing along the back being like, there are no traps and there is no history. Why am uh, I right. here? What am exactly. I doing here? <laughs> I could have exactly. stayed at the tavern. <laughs> uh-huh. No, yeah, for sure. 
I totally understand that. I very much understand that. <laughs> All right, let's talk combat encounters. Ooh. How do you make... So the worst kinds of combat encounters, in my opinion, yes. are he hits you, you hit him. He uh -huh. hits you, you hit him. It's, uh -huh. it's fine once. Yes. But more than one of those is just, it's boring combat. How can we make dungeon combat more exciting? <sighs> I got a really good example for that. Brain. So one thing I like to do is I like to add just either one or two extra elements in the combat session where it's not just you're fighting. Like yeah. it's not just you hit, you hit, he hits, you hit, he hits, you hit type of thing. I like to throw in just one extra thing. Like uh, I'll give you a good example with one of the one shots I did. My players went into this, like these catacombs and they found that there was a portal that lead to hell pretty much. And this, uh, there was a, um, Rikishi. Not a Rikishi. Is it Rikishi? The 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 tiger humanoid looking dude. Is that it? Anyway, everyone everyone knows in the comments what I'm trying to talk about. The very tiger powerful. Yes. yes, yes. Um. So he was controlling this army, and he was bringing people through, and um, they also captured a bunch of civilians. And so when they got in there, they saw this whole operation going on. They saw these captured civilians. They saw Manticore down there being um, controlled as well. And so my players were like, all right, this is really easy. Let's, let's go down there. Let's, let's kick their butts and then we'll save the people. And like, obviously that's what they thought, but they all failed their stealth checks, obviously. Of course. And, um, that's what stealth checks are for. Uh, yeah. They failed their stealth checks and I made a certain, uh, I made a certain mechanic in there where they actually booby trapped the whole thing the whole catacombs. So one of the minions, it was like a fire minion. I can't remember. I can't, I can't remember the names, but would go over to this, uh, this fuse and they lit the fuse and each round there would be some part of the, uh, there'd be some part of this huge operation room that would explode and get destroyed. And so I told my players, I was like, you have 10 rounds to do this and the whole thing's done. And so when that happened, it was very interesting to see what everyone came to do because a lot of people were like, okay, we need to go stop. We need to go start, stop the tiger person and the manticore because that's really bad. And other people were like, okay, well, we now got to go save these people. And it just became this huge kerfuffle of things. And people were trying to figure out what to do. There was some miscommunication that happened on certain as aspects, but like after the battle, that was like one of the most memorable battles because they had to do so many things than just, you know, bunk. They had to go save people. They had to go save themselves. They had to make sure the whole thing doesn't come tumbling down on them. They had to really calculate their plans because they only had 10 rounds to do something. And so like a whole round could be them just trying to get to what, like moving 30 feet. And then that's it. And it's like, cool. You only got nine more rounds now. Yeah. And so it's just like throwing an extra element of something yeah. where you have to make them think about what to do instead of just attack. It is so much fun. It is so much fun. The ones that I can think of off the top of my head, like you said, ticking time bomb, yep. absolute gold, stress yeah. your players out. You can yes. do it with counters. You uh -huh. can also, um, if you're doing puzzles or something like that, you can use an actual timer or an egg timer. Ooh. Something like that is gold. If it's something that you want is more a player thing than a yeah. character thing. So it's like yeah. you have this amount of time to decide. Boom. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to up the tension and stop them just like sitting there and yawning and getting more snacks. Uh, like, right. Focus their minds with death. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh, what else? The floor is lava or that one's whatever. A good one. Difficult terrain. Mm -hmm. um, fun, slidey things. Uh, there's, there's so many elements that you can bring in. Uh, one of the ones that it took me a really long time to learn as a GM is mooks. Bring mooks. Not not just the main dude. Make sure that there's more than one oh. person and that they are they have different aims. So mm -hmm. the main dude is in the battle, but the, the minions are trying to open a summoning circle and yeah. trying to do another thing and going off to get resources. And um that, like you said, it splits the party's focus and it gives them more different things to think about. Exactly, exactly. And that's when it's more fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, like really, I think digging into complexity of encounters 
because otherwise yeah. it it's really like you hit him he mm -hmm. hits you <laughs> yeah counter spell oh no <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so speaking of timers yes. how do you handle dungeon puzzles they are a foundational part of the genre they are notoriously difficult yes. for players to get behind any tips for handling puzzles so i will say mine and i'll say what my my dungeon master is doing right now and i absolutely yeah. love what he has um mainly for me i will look up puzzles that have just very simple solutions to them that make them look hard but they're just simple like you see this door like <laughs> You could put a door in front of every D and D player in the world, and the first thing they'll do is, "I'm going to investigate the door. I'm going to try to unlock the door." And I, I've had to tell my players so many times, "Just be like, just open the door. It's unlocked. Just grab the knob and turn it and open it." Like it, it's the basic thing that people will try to overthink every single thing you do, but it always yeah. comes down to being the most basic of tasks. And so, like, keep throwing the most basic of tasks at players. Um, that's what I enjoy doing. Like, oh, you got to stand on one side. It's like a little, like a teeter totter thing where if you stand on one end, it's going to go down. You got to figure out the weight, um, like super simple, super easy, Yeah. but your players will find some way to break it or make it harder than it is. And that's, what's so much fun because by the end, you just tell them what it is and you all are just in tears laughing about it. Um, but what my DM does, and I really like what he does, is yeah. he will present some type of conflict or puzzle. And he will have a lot of situations, like he will have a big circle of situations where things that won't work, but will work. Um, but most of the time, he'll just listen to us and see what we come up with nice. And like, if it's creative enough, he'll be like, no, that was really freaking cool. I'll let you guys do it. Like it opens or you get through the portal like that. That's super dope. And I don't want all that hard work and excitement to go away and be for nothing. Um, I love what he does, but if it's like, like we were trying to get past this force guardian this other time uh, when we were playing and we were trying to get through and we kept getting hit back and it just wasn't working. One of our players was Faye. And so he was able to get through just fine, but none of us could. Um, and so we winded up, uh, uh getting one of our one of our characters down to zero hit points so he was dead um but we stabled him i can't i can't remember the spell i'm not a spelled person i'm a material fighter um false life i think it's false life oh yeah um but he just he was um no it's not false life anyway it, it's something where they're at zero hit points and they're stable and they're fine but yeah. we were able to grab them and our fey person was able to hold our dead friend and they were able to get through the um, the Guardian just fine. And like, it was super cool. He said, that's not the way you would do it. But it was so cool that I let you do it. Um, so that's um, that's kind of how I handle things with the puzzles. Like, I'll, I have a basic thing. But now I'm also going to start implementing, like, if they figure something that's very out of the box, but and it makes sense, yeah. like, totally 100% going to let them through. But if it's like, they get a really creative idea, but it's so wrong. Like you definitely still got to crush it, yeah. <laughs> like crush their dreams. Cause that's what makes it hilarious at the same time. Uh, I, love, I love that idea where essentially, you know, if the players are creative enough, they are right uh -huh. by dint of like, yes, do you know what? I have yes. an idea, but that's cool. Yes, that's right. You uh -huh. don't even Rule need to tell cool. them that at the time. Yeah. You can tell them that afterwards. I would recommend it because it makes yes. you look like at the time it doesn't break the tension and it also stops uh -huh. the players thinking, Oh, what else can I just be cool about? And exactly. What limits exactly. can I push? Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I really like that. I like to do a thing which I call an explosive pass where okay. essentially if they're trying and they're trying and it's just taking a really long time, mm -hmm. I will allow them to have a pass with a something that ups the ante. So if okay. they're sitting there at the door and they're trying to open the door and they've tried this and they try that and they try the other, eventually a guard on the inside will open the door and attack them. Oh, I like that. I like so that idea. You stop, you stop the, 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 essentially you get them over that impasse because a lot of yes. times with puzzles, players just get stuck. Yeah. Um, and they, they can't get forward. They get, they get anxiety. They they get uh -huh. they, they get stuck. They can't move forward. They don't know how to move forward. And it, often it, I've seen this with players where they don't they can't even begin to start thinking of the answer. <laughs> yes. Where they're just looking at it and they're like, 
I wasn't expecting this. I thought I was going to hit something and they uh -huh. just lost. So, yes. yeah, I like to use explosive passes. Like, um, that's one example. Another example that I've used in the past is um, uh, you did something that was too loud and now you've alerted the guards, but the guards mm. have opened the door. Um, yeah. Uh, you take too long, you trigger something, the thing blows up, you take <laughs> damage, but now you can get through. Right. No, I, I love that. I haven't even thought about that, honestly. Yeah, like, an explosive pass. So it's I something like that, that moves the story forward and gives a disadvantage. I really somehow. like that. Because uh, I think for me, that's the biggest thing to watch with puzzles. Puzzles can stop the action if you're not it careful. They can. It really like, can. It's okay if the players are stuck at a puzzle. Sorry, if the characters are stuck at a puzzle for three yeah. hours. Your players should not be stuck at a puzzle for three hours. Yes. No, that uh, we've, we've, I've had a couple of those when we were playing Tomb of Annihilation where we were just stuck and we couldn't do anything and it was, yeah. it was horrible. And it, it turns out to be the most simplest solution. It was like, oh, we wasted so much time in that. Now I'm not like really in the game anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's what you want to avoid. That's why I'm like, if it uh -huh. down, blow it up. Uh, right, blow it right. up blow it up or have it melt or have it attack you or something move yes. have something to move forward because there's nothing worse than having them just stuck because then they get bored and then it's not a mm -hmm. game anymore see if right what people do wrong with dungeons yep bam <laughs> <laughs> so my next question social encounters in dungeons how are we talking about like Role playing between characters or role playing with like other NPCs? Uh, well, either actually. Either okay. Um, I would say I'll split up in two. I would say for role playing with other PCs with other players, um, I think one you you have to create puzzles or situations where the team has to work together. And has to talk through things. I feel like that's one very good way to do it. Another good way to do it is maybe throw in some elements in a dungeon that will bring up the players' pasts that they'll have to talk about and explain a little bit, so people get a better idea on how this player is thinking and why they should do it th this certain way. Um, you know, it, like I guess, like find encounters that can bring up conversation. Like that—that's kind of the best way I can do it. Like, don't just be like don't just straight up say like, Hey, this is where you guys should role play a bit or something like that. Um, but definitely like throw them encounters that will get them talking, that will get them thinking that will start asking each other questions. Uh, ha even have them show something like there, there's like some picture on a wall where it shows that the mother protecting her child. And like someone's backstory is like, I was a mother protecting my child, but I failed and like showing that and showing them alive and, you know, like that will get conversations going and it's really good and people kind of get more of a heart to heart and it really just amps things up. Like it's like, all right, we're not doing this for us anymore. We're doing this for like your child, which is really good. Um, social encounters for like other NPCs and things like that. Um, oh, it's kind of hard. I, I guess the one big thing that I would suggest is maybe throwing in some elements so i don't know if anyone here has uh read the percy jackson books uh i haven't they were my, but i know you have, many on the audience have i'm familiar yes. with the genre i I, yes. I know about them yeah percy jackson is my favorite they just casted percy jackson in the tv show a couple days ago and i'm so freaking pumped i cannot wait but anyway in the fourth book they go into a labyrinth and spoiler alert if anyone's reading it cover your ears don't mute because I'm about to spoil something. Uh, when they're going through the labyrinth, um, throughout the whole book, Grover, one of the characters, he's a satyr. He's trying to find the their god Pan. He's been yeah. missing for a long time. And when they're in the labyrinth, they suddenly find him. He's been stuck in this labyrinth for so long. And Grover finally finds him. He's the first satyr who finally found Pan. And people, it's an incredible moment. Like, as me as a reader... Like suddenly he's there and he's like, oh my gosh, he's been trapped here the whole time. Well, he wasn't really trapped. He was enjoying his best life pretty much. Um, but they up. had, yeah, <laughs> but they had a very good conversation with that. It was like, oh, we finally found something. Something's living and they're talking back and forth. And it makes sense why he was there. And it fulfilled Grover 
a whole arc and it was amazing. And um, that that's something that you could do with like a social encounter for like NPCs in a way, like have it be, they find someone they've been trying to find for a while. Or they find someone there who can give them more information or um, like, I'm trying to steer away from just combat. I don't want to just do combat. Cause that, yeah. that's easy to do, but um, like have someone's soul trapped in a bottle or where they can like ask the bottle questions and the, the bottle will give them answers, things like that. So um, th- th- that's a good way to get things going. If they're trying to find a piece of information, it's always fun to have like some NPC there to give them that information or complete an arc. So I, I don't know, man, I talking about the Percy Jackson here. I'm so freaking stoked for it. Sorry. I got really excited talking about that whole thing. <laughs> I know. I'm so glad. I, I yes. want people to be excited about stuff. That's yes, awesome. yes. <laughs> so uh, funny you mentioned a soul in a bottle. One of the ways that I've done this is I've I've used a ghost to give hints Ooh. on a puzzle. Oh, I like that. That's interesting. So you have like quite an obnoxious ghost, but if you yeah. if you persuaded them right, you could get them to give you hints on the puzzle mm-hmm. and help you get through. Yeah. Um, guardians make great npcs to chat with yes they can give information they can give you hints they can they can help you with stuff um i've had a sentient door in one of my things yes. the puzzle door was sentient he sang little songs it was really fun to gm <laughs> just saying um that's awesome dorian obviously um I, there, there is no gms without punning it's not for me um <laughs> but yeah so <laughs> I think you can have social encounters in dungeons. I think they could yeah. be valuable. And I think that it's something, if people forget one thing in dungeons, it's social encounters for me. Yeah. Like that's that's yeah. the thing people miss. And I feel like they can be really valuable and you can be very clever about them. Sentient yes. monsters is the other way. No, that is really good. Because again, a lot of people, when they think dungeon, it's they're kind of abandoned. They were built there a while ago for people to not get the treasure. But it's like, no, it could be like a newer dungeon and it's just like a scientist working in there who doesn't want people to come steal his work. Yeah, exactly. There's like, so many different reasons for dungeons, like mm-hmm. lost things that have been re-inhabited by monstrous yeah. species. That's my favorite kind of dun- dungeon because um, <laughs> I'm obsessed with history. But um, yeah, like there's all sorts of reasons why people would create dungeons that aren't necessarily, you know, hero obstacle races. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking oh, of sure. which, how can you make traps more interesting? Again, a critical part of the genre, traps and dungeons, like PB and J. How do you yes. make traps more interesting? I would make traps more interesting. So I would make traps more interesting where it really has to make the players think. Again, it's not very good to make just a sudden death, uh, a death spike trap in the middle of the floor and it's just like oh roll a dex check okay you miss well it opens and you're dead like that's no fun yeah. it's fun for when the where you make a trap and you give the players an option on how they want to work with this trap and it honestly it comes down to them at that part where it's like okay i am now in this encounter my character is in this encounter it is now up to me to decide what i need to do because my decision will either make it so they live or they die. Um, so and not everything has to be around death as well. Traps don't have to be around death. So I'll give a couple of really good examples that my friend told me about. And from what I saw that happened with um, in Tomb of Annihilation. So there was a part where I failed some type of check when I went into a room. Yeah. And then um, my my DM was like, okay, you just failed the check. And I went, oh, okay, cool. Um, and so like we went through and then all of a sudden we get down to the very bottom of this, of the dungeon. And all of a sudden there's another me trapped in a cage. And what it came down to is when I went into that room, I got knocked out and I was replaced by a doppelganger. So I was being a doppelganger the whole time. And then when we went down and we found the real me there, by the way, if anyone's a fan of uh, my characters from TikTok, Tors was the character, the barbarian bartender nice. that I have. Um, that was him. And so he got replaced. And so when we went to the boss's room, suddenly this doppelganger, who I thought was me, has all of my gear, has all of my weapons. And now I have to fight him and kill him, which I did. I was so proud of my boy. Um it, it was awesome. Um, so that was one of them. That was an amazing trap. And I absolutely loved it. It blew my mind because I had to play 
two of me at once. And then I had to also like, it kept me thinking like, yeah, what happened? Why, why did nothing happen? I rolled really low. What happened type of thing. So that was great. Another one that was really good with the trap was, um, there's a small corridor and all of a sudden there's a gelatinous cube that falls from the ceiling and it starts moving its way towards you and it cuts off. Um, or no, 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 sorry. There's, there's a big corridor. One half of the party gets forward. The other half is behind and there's a gelatinous cube that falls right between them. And so the both parties have to figure out how to get back to each other and also not die because of the cube. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, those are interesting where you really start making the players think and you make them wonder, but also you got to make them start critical thinking as yeah. well. That's where good traps come to play. Those were fun traps coming to play. Those are where the memorable traps come to play. Traps for story. Yes. A trap is a and story. Actually, traps that are puzzles is what yeah. I'm hearing. Those traps yeah. have so interesting puzzle elements. They do. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, a trap should never one shot player. No. If your trap one shots a player, you've got the wrong, you've, you've, you've done something wrong as a yeah. GM because yeah. that's not fun. It's not fun no. to step on a pressure plate and die at the end. Yeah. Unless it's, it's a very different kind of game that I'm playing. Yeah. Um, you don't one shot your players with traps. It's sad. That's mm -hmm. the end of my TED talk. Uh, it is. It is. <laughs> so uh, I love that traps, traps for traps as puzzles, traps for story. I think, yeah. I am completely on board with that. Or yes. even traps to up the ante. Yes. You know, that's a good traps one. that make the doors close in, traps that make the walls close down. And now you have to choose between staying to get the treasure or leaving the room and not getting mad. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good traps. That's they, these are these are great traps that make people mm -hmm. want to continue playing and excited. Yeah. Uh, another trap I'll I'll say as well. Um Sorry, this is kind of not like totally focused on dungeon, but it actually it like really makes people think was my players were trying to infiltrate a camp one time. Yeah. And there were obviously there were people in trees like looking out, like trying to make sure no one infiltrates because in the middle of the camp was a king. Yeah. And so like my players went in and they were like, oh, this is going to be easy. We see one of the spies up there. Let's just snipe him down. And that's it. We won't have any problems. And so like, you also got to make sure that like NPCs and traps, they have to be smart. Yeah. Like they're, they're not just dumb. They're not just there to just do whatever. And so what I was thinking, I was like, Hey, what would happen? What would these spies wear or have on them that if someone did take them out, cause they're not going to be dumb. They're protecting a King. Yeah. Um, it's like, what would happen? What would they wear? And so I went, Ooh, they would wear something around their waist where if they hit the ground hard enough, they were there would be like this big bang or crackling noise and so when my players sniped them down they were like oh that was easy he fell to the ground hit and there was this bunch of lights and like almost like uh those like little firework crackle balls they're like green you light them and they're like they shoot out and they crackle and they're light that, that's what i did but he had them all around his waist and so when he hit the ground it alerted everyone wow, that like yeah. someone was there and so that just upped the ante with them they're like oh these guys aren't stupid Oh, we should have thought of that. And it just, it made it so much more fun for them. Yeah. I love so, that. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's all I had to say. Traps, that's all fun, guys. Traps, yes. that's all fun. See, for reference, dungeons should be fun. I think that's, yes. that's my big takeaway. Dungeons should be fun. Very fun dungeons, unless they're Tomb of Annihilation. That's <laughs> when you're stressed the whole time. <laughs> All right, I think that is the perfect time to get to our audience questions. There are some let's incredible go. questions here. I don't know if we'll be able to get it through all of them, but let's try. How right. do you know, asks World Keymaster, how long your one shot is in hours or time when you write them? Is there a word count that equals X hours? No. <laughs> that is Correct. up to your players to decide how long you play. It is not up to you. I mean, it is up to you, but you kind of have to railroad them. But it, that is up to the players to let you know how long this dungeon is going to be. But it, I, I, but it, there's also something that you have to mention to your players as well. Like, hey, guys, uh, there's a few things that are coming up. Either I'm busy, so we got to keep it under two hours. So, like, you can research rooms, but we can't stay long in the room. Like, we got to keep moving forward. Like, don't be afraid to push your players in directions. They will understand 
if you let them know beforehand. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. like, yeah, there's no word count. You could write a two word thing that says a dungeon and they will, <laughs> they could spend 10 hours in that dungeon Yeah, it's true. or they could be like, Oh, a dungeon and then leave in two seconds. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I'm sorry. Are... No, <laughs> No, 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 it's it's totally true. And again, it depends so much on the group and how much RP uh-huh. they want to do and uh-huh. how long they take to get through a round and on all of these things. I think when you're writing one shots for others, which is what our bean's doing right now, there's uh-huh. two tricks that you can ha- keep in mind. Yeah. Um, the one is you can make things that are optional. So mm-hmm. particularly you can make a combat in a room that is optional. Yeah. Um, and you can have, if you want to shortcut this combat, this. There's mm-hmm. a group of cobalts that you need to fight, or there's a group of cobalts that accidentally triggered a trap and they're all dead. Yeah. Like, it's up to you. If they're all dead, you loot the bodies and move on. It's quick. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you have a combat and it's exciting. It depends mm-hmm. on what the clock is doing. Also, if your party is really slow, I've done a lot of one-shots that have become two-shots. Yeah. It's, if everybody's got time, if you can pick it up again, it's fine. Yeah. Like, it's okay, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say don't worry too much about it if you're um, if you're aiming to give flexibility, then you can write those sort of little modular things like if you want to shorten this, do this yeah. um, or if you want to extend your one shot, do this or if your players haven't picked up the critical item, they can find it here. Right. Like that. There's right. ways. To write. Yes. Yes. Oh, you bring up a very good point. Sorry. When people are in a dungeon and their whole task is to find a certain thing in said dungeon and you have it in a certain room, but they're just not going to that room or they skip the room. There is nothing wrong with moving that object to a different part of the room. So they find it and that speeds things up. That is very freaking important. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sometimes you move the thing to where the players are. We've already yes. talked about that before, Nothing wrong with that. Put it directly in front of their eyes so they cannot yes. possibly miss it. Exactly. And I've been a player. Sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what it is your GM wants you to be doing without your GM mm-hmm. being like, guys, you've got to go to this room. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's all, it's fair play on both sides. Um, yeah. The best way to figure out how long your one shot takes is to play it a bunch of times and then get an average. I wish there were an easier way. You yeah. can guess. You know, the X number of combats, if, if you put more combats, it's going to be longer. But in general, the only way is to play. Yeah, exactly. Um, can you consider traveling from point A to point B a dungeon? Kind of. Kind of. That's it's very broad question. I'm trying to figure out what exactly they so, mean by that. I, have- I mean... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go. No, 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 no. Anyway, um, I, I mean, yes. That's, that's such a broad question. I mean, getting from point A to point B is that considered any dungeon? Yes. But also, like, dungeons are, in a, like, how I think of a dungeon is you are in closed of rooms and, like, you got to stay within the rooms. There's not much to explore besides what the DM has planned for, like, the other rooms and things like that. Um, that's what I consider a dungeon. If you are, like, playing a one shot where it's, like, you're in a town and you got to travel to another town, uh, mm, I don't really, like, think that is kind of a dungeon because... Like players could be like, okay, we're in this town. All right, let's go again. Let's go into the forest. Oh, th- there was something very interesting over here that the DM said that holds nothing to the storyline, but we're going to go check it out. And we're, we're now not in this wall. We're now outside of the wall and we can do that. And so like, that's not really like point a, like point a to point B in my opinion, that's what a dungeon is. Like, that's what they're made for getting from point A to point B. The, the scenario I get, gave is kind of like getting from point A, but then we're, we go to point A, point B, and then the A point B turns into suddenly D, and now they got to get back to going to, back to point B. Like that, I hope that explains what I'm trying to think of. <laughs> 
I think I got it. Uh, there is a no. tiny bit of explaining how to put together IKEA furniture in that explanation, yeah. but I got it. I got it. I think I got okay, it. Okay, yeah. Thank you for the question. I'm so great I would at say talking. There is, you are amazing at talking. These are really difficult things to discuss and, and explain. Are. You're doing amazing, Duke. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here. Trying. So I would say there is something called the five room dungeon theory. It's very, very interesting. It's by a man called John Four. I want to write an article about it. I haven't done it yet because who has the time to do things these days? But um, yeah, uh, so that article is amazing. And I would say you can use those principles and turn them into turn them into what is not a dungeon. Yes. Right. Absolutely. You can do that. Uh, you can use a lot of the principles. If you take the map away from a dungeon, what a dungeon is, is a series of doors and a series of experiences. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, yes. You can use a lot of the same kind of ideas and put them into a journey. So, yeah. for example, your players are trying to get from point A to point B. What does that involve? That involves a lot of sequential experiences. They can go back. They can go forward. They make decisions. Stuff happens. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You can use a lot of the same things. The difference is that feeling of um, constriction, that feeling of yeah. railroad. Because in a journey from A to B, you can just, as Duke said, you can decide just, okay, we're going to D. Or we're going mm -hmm. via D on our A to, exactly. D, like a to B journey. In a dungeon, there are strict se sequences that you cannot bypass. You have yeah. to go through this room to get through that, to get to that room. You cannot go around it somehow. Yeah. So I would say that's where it differs. You cannot take the scenic route. In a dungeon, there are strict pathways. But a lot of the stuff that we've discussed today is very applicable. Yes. Yeah. Um, good question. Interesting question. Yes. Uh, great one here from Kayatan. What would be a dungeon in a sci-fi setting? I have actually made a dungeon in a sci-fi oh. setting for Infinite Black. So um, spaceships make very nice dungeons. Abandoned labs make very nice dungeons. I made one full of all sorts of horrible, horrible things because it was for apocalyptic space horror RPG Ooh, that I was commissioned nice. to write. Really fun. Lots of tentacles. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so abandoned labs, spaceships, space stations... Um, anything, anything can be a dungeon. Exactly what yeah. you would consider. Ancient ruins can be sci-fi. Just saying. I put yeah. a whack and great psychotic AI in mine uh, with a roll table of personalities. One of them was a British nanny, which I thought was particularly fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so like the Barry Poppins of psychotic AIs. But um, yeah, this is this is also, that's those are those are sci-fi dungeons. Yeah, they exist. Yeah, yeah, They're there. yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> um, let's have a look at ooh, all-time favorite dungeon, including TTRPGs and video games. What do you think? This one's just oh. everything's unavailable. Oh, favorite dungeon? <sighs> you have one? Yeah, I have one. I try to figure out which one I want to talk about. <laughs> talk about them all. No, like top three. Top three. Okay, the ones that come to my mind is yeah. I like my worm dungeon I made. I love. I absolutely love that one because when I told my players about that I built it around the anatomy and I actually dove into it, their faces were like in shock <laughs> that I actually went that far. And that's the that. only reason I love that dungeon so much is they were just in awe with <laughs> how complex I made it. It was fantastic. Um, another dungeon I really love playing is from Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time the Deku tree, just because it was, that's my childhood. That's where you start everything off. That is my favorite one. The music, everything just brings back so many good memories. Third dungeon. Um, I really, really, oh no, there's a dungeon that I always like, what is it? What is it? What is it? It's already the tip of my tongue. Um, Oh, oh, for some reason, uh, the, the other one, again, for, comes from Legend of Zelda, the Spirit Temple from Ooh. Ocarina of Time. Like, I love that one. That one's fun. I don't know why. It's just very different. It, 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 it requires a lot of thinking, and it's like an illusion one, too. And so, like, I don't know. I, I really like that one. And transferring between being an adult and Link, that's always really, that's just a hoot. So, yeah. Love it. <laughs> love it. Some, some good references there. Thank you. Nice. And yeah, I think that just goes to show that like dungeons are completely transmedia and you can learn yeah. about dungeons from a lot of different spaces. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there is an amazing comment here from Bonnie Juju. Was it from Bonnie? Ju no, from Darkest Hobbit, who says, I can't agree with what we were talking about, about dungeons being linear. A group oh. I was in at a D&D &D table I was running decided to exit the dungeon through the roof. <laughs> I want to play at that table. It sounds hilarious. <laughs> That's when you as a DM need to use the ban hammer of saying no. <laughs> or just players, man. Or just players, players yeah. <laughs> Again, there's nothing wrong with telling your players no. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any advice for playtesting your dungeons? I just... I. I play them myself. Like I create characters and I will go through the dungeon and I'll just be like, okay, this happens. I roll. And it's just like, okay, I was able to succeed three fourths of the time. I feel like that's really good. Oh, this one's kind of more intense. What happens if they fail or seed? Okay. It's a little bit rougher. Uh, I'll take it down. I just play it myself. Nice. Like that, that's what I do. And if I get frustrated at certain points or if I don't really know, or if it's just like, oh, I can't do it. That's when I know like, okay, I need to change some things in it. But yeah, sorry. I, I wish I had a better, more clear answer, but no, I just I think, play test them. I think that's a really, really good point. A lot of people feel yeah. like they need a, a strict play test structure and forms yeah, no. and they need to hand it through seven GMs. You can start by just playing itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's fun. It's fun. And depending, like if you want to publish it in a, a high level something, 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 then yeah, yeah, maybe play test it with some other people. If you're just running it for your group, that's enough. That's fine. Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't need more than that. Great question here about high-level dungeons, like level 17 plus. Ooh. Oh, sorry, high, epic level one-shots. Any advice for epic level one-shots? I beg your pardon. Ooh, epic level one-shots. Um, oh, man, that's so... That is a tough question because high levels, you're able to do so much. Yeah. And I guess it just depends on... What I like to do is to help me. I will see what my characters build first. And then I will work my dungeon around their characters in a way. So like, if they're really good at something, I'm going to throw something that's kind of where they're bad at, where it's like they can't really overcome it. So they have still a challenge in there because I could throw in so many things and I could pre-make a dungeon and then my players can make characters that totally just wipe this dungeon to the floor and they have no problem getting through it. Um, you still want to make some type of issues where they do have to struggle, like definitely poke at that like negative one strength modifier they have or the negative two charisma modifier and they get charmed, things like that. Um, you definitely got to look at their weaknesses. Also look at their strengths because it's also really good and really rewarding for a player to use something that's high leveled or they get to use that power and save their party or things like that. Like definitely throw that in as well. Um, I also like to make things in a way where it's, um, they have to use kind of a bit of their spell slots or use a lot of their features just to make sure they survive because it's not very fun to have all these features and spells when you can't use them. Spend resources. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Spend their resources. Like spending resources and them having come to the very end where they have to spend even more resources. It's wonderful. That is like, oh, I love that because that's when they really start to think. Yeah. Um, in a high level dungeon though, depending on what they have, if they're high enough, that's when I would almost throw in some instant death things, but they still have the option because they do have features. They do have things that can save them. Yeah. Um, because they're, they're, they are so overpowered. Like yeah. there could be a death spike trap and a monk can trip it, but then they have slow fall yeah. and th then they're fine. Like things yeah. like that, like definitely throw in some of those aspects where, you know, they're really high level. They have a lot of really cool things that could prevent them from meeting death, but still they also need to be like careful at the same time. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know if that takes away. I don't know if that takes away from saying don't put death things, but that's more of like when they're beginning level and they're trying to build up to this because there's no way they can stop those death traps when they're higher level. Yes, they do have way they, they, where they can stop those death traps. But I think a lot of what you said earlier, where it's it's much more geared at the player than the character, like a lot yeah. of these um, 
the puzzles and a lot of these sort of like interesting moments and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's where it really comes in. Like, yes, okay, they can they can one shot an enemy, but can they sweet talk an mm -hmm. enemy? And yeah. can they sweet talk Ooh, an enemy yes. of the right level, right? Yeah. Um so so I think that's again where, you know, okay, you have these in a one a one level very OP characters, very overpowered. Yeah. Um, but you can really bring other elements to the fore for. I love what you said as well about like making them suffer but letting them <laughs> shine. I think that's a really exactly. important line to tell. Exactly. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and it, I mean that honestly, that's good advice for characters of any every level. They shouldn't feel like oh, frost weakness is the only weakness I don't have, and yep. the GM is just throwing. Sorry, it's frost weakness is the only weakness that I have, and GM is just throwing frost, yeah. frost creatures at me. It shouldn't yeah. feel vindictive. No, there should be a variety of things where you know everyone suffers a bit. The suffering is shared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. We have so many great questions. But guys, we do not have time for any more. I'm so sorry. We will be uh, talking again about one shots tomorrow. Um, and indeed, next week, I happen to know we Ooh. have a bunch of one shot materials over on our stages. That's on Thursday and Sunday. On Friday next week, we will be doing a trash my battle map. So we encourage you to bring <laughs> your one shot battle maps and we will help you improve them via the studied method of trashing. And that's I not going to be that. me. That's going to be Demetrius and the amazing award winning Kaora. Yeah, he made this, but he makes battle maps Ooh, too. Nice. So, um, that's going to be our mapping stream and uh yeah not to be missed so guys so much going on next week do tune in and tomorrow we have our very first live streamed stage so our sunday Ooh. events are moving to twitch they're not gonna be on discord anymore so keep an eye out for that and uh yeah come join madeline as she talks about all things awesome uh just before we go, I would like to tell you where we are going. So some of our very long term World Anvil members are Dungeons and Randomness. Their podcast has been going on for 10 years now. 10 Ooh. years of D&D podcasting goodness they've been doing. And uh, they've been with World Anvil for quite a lot of that now, which is pretty awesome. So they are doing a very special 10 year celebration on one shots using one shots incidentally we are going to be raiding them right now so stick oh. around exactly where you are you you earn 250 of your finest anvil points um just for just for taking part duke we know where we yes. can we can find you why should yes. we come check out your youtube channel because we are going to be making a lot of content that you guys have not seen before we are really trying to bring fantasy into real life we want to show what it could look like to cast actual spells and what it would look like in real life. We're really excited. We got that in the works. Uh, we're going to be busting a lot of mechanics or myths. We're kind of being myth busters, but we're trying to figure out a different name. Just can't call ourselves myth busters. Um, we are going to be going through mechanics. We got actual professional sword fighters coming in who are, we're going to film and they we're going to see if combat is actually realistic. Does it take six seconds for a whole turn to go around and Incredible. it's gonna be really cool we got a lot of really cool things happening and we're very excited and we cannot wait and we got other ones where we are going to be giving back to the community as well just a lot of fantastic things coming in i, I really hope you i yeah just just yeah. watch it yay's. <laughs> yeah yes guys we will have yays yes so guys, you can check out uh duke's channel on the link that we just shared so do go and check that out it's going to be absolutely hilarious uh we are going on the raid right now a big thank you to our subscribers this week and uh, everyone who threw bits my goodness a lot of you and um Ooh. yeah in the meantime i would invite you to grab your hammer and go world build talk to you soon guys bye